Okay, we're all set for recording. All right. Um, I'll get started. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Uh, today is August 31st, 2022. It's one o'clock and I call this meeting to order. Uh, looks like, uh, I mean, I've got quite a few remarks, so this might be a longer meeting today, um, but let me just get going. Um, first, I just wanted to clarify something that I mentioned at our last meeting about cultivators that may have jumped the gun and started planting prior to being licensed by the board. Um, let me try to be as clear as possible. Um, what you are doing is a crime. Um, you are in criminal jeopardy if you're growing more than the home grow limits without a license. The cannabis board has no authority to direct law enforcement agencies or to stop state's attorneys from prosecuting crimes. And I apologize if that was not clear. The point that I was making um, is that the CCB will not penalize you. We will not revoke your application. We won't impose a fine or an administrative penalty or refer your case to law enforcement under the following conditions. First, you have a pending cultivation application before the board and you're making a good faith effort to complete the application. Um, two, you're operating within the scope of the license that you're seeking. You know, if you applied for a tier one license, you can't have 2,500 square feet of canopy or more than 200, 125 plants. Um, if you're, and you have to be complying with all other regulations that apply to your license type, things like inventory tracking and record keeping, advertising restrictions, pesticide usage, et cetera. And finally, you can't be committing other crimes, such as selling your products to the public, particularly to youth, uh, moving cannabis across state lines, um, or inverting illegal cannabis into the legal market. So this is not an invitation to break the law. Um, this is a recognition by the board that we asked the legacy market to go legal, and we're not gonna punish the very people that took us up on this offer while we work through pending applications. Again, we can't control how law enforcement agencies will react if they get a complaint about an unlicensed grow. It's probably also important to discuss how the cannabis board interacts with law enforcement more broadly. Um, this is one of those highly regulated industries that exists under the specter of state and federal criminal enforcement. If you intentionally and sometimes unintentionally break the rules governing your license. The Cannabis Board is not a law enforcement agency, and our compliance team are not law enforcement officers. Um, we don't wear badges. We don't carry guns. We don't have the authority to arrest people or refer a case to a prosecutor. However, the legislature did grant the, the Cannabis Board primary compliance and enforcement authority over the adult and medical markets. We intend to take an education first approach um, we know our rules are brand new and licensees might make good faith mistakes. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to mention that our inspectors had visited over 100 grow sites already and without fail, everyone is doing their best to follow the rules and operate within the scope of their license. So thank you for that. Um, but if we receive a complaint or observe evidence of a violation, our compliance team will conduct an investigation. The results of that investigation may result in no action. It may result in a warning, a fine, a suspension of a license, or any of the other administrative actions that are listed in our board rule number four. Uh, if we have credible evidence of criminal activity, we may need to refer the matter to a law enforcement agency to con con for them to conduct their own investigation that may lead to a criminal referral. I would very much hope that these are the very rare cases, though. Um, the primary law enforcement agency that we could be referring credible criminal investigations to is the Department of Liquor and Lottery. Um, their enforcement division is comprised of sworn law enforcement officers. Um, we can't control um, 
the 100 or so law enforcement agencies around the state. If a local police department receives a complaint about a cannabis operation, they may come and investigate on their own, even if you're licensed. We are developing guidance for law enforcement and we'll be providing a training to hopefully get everyone on the same page. But to think that there's gonna be 100% uniformity around the state, particularly early on, is probably unrealistic. But getting your license and complying with the board regulations is always your best defense when, it, when anyone shows up at your door, whether that's a CCB inspector, uh, Department of Liquor and Lottery officer, or any other law enforcement officer. Um, an update on licensing. You know, I, we haven't held meetings for the past two weeks in order to allow some of our staff here to catch their breath for the fall. Um, but looking at the register for this week, it's hard to believe that anyone actually did take a break. Um, we have over 60 applications up for approval, um, including a number of wholesalers and product manufacturers. The two integrated applications are near completion and we've begun our review of retail applications. I'd remind everyone watching that retail applications are complicated and require jurisdictional input from many agencies that we cannot control or expedite. Um, fire safety, the Department of Taxes, there's local approvals, um, including can local cannabis control commissions if they exist. There's the Department of Liquor and Lottery, if you're gonna be selling any kind of vape cartridge or vaping device. Um, and then there's potential for Act 250 permits as well. Um, in general, uh, you need to have all of these approvals worked out before the CCB can issue you a license. So when you think about everything that goes into this, you know, I have a hard time believing we would have been able to license any significant number of retail applications in the one month period between September and October that the legislature prescribed in Act 164. October 1st remains our target date, but we can't make any promises. We want these license to, licenses to be issued as much as anyone, but there's no way for us to cut corners. Our primary objective is to roll this market out safely, effectively, and equitably, and we are not going to compromise that mandate in order to meet an arbitrary deadline. Um, a quick update on uh, the market and how it's shaping up. Um, our consultants have started to plug the raw data of our licensing numbers into their market analysis model. Um, we have posted the updated model to our website, um, but unless you know how to use it and you know how to manipulate the underlying equations and assumptions, it can be a little inaccessible. Um, just one example, um, it has a random number generator in it to account for uncertainty when the, you know around things like when the board was actually able to issue licenses and when licensees were actually able to begin operating. So this means that every time you open the model or hit F9, um, the model will spit out different results uh, with respect to what this market will look like in year one and two. Um, also, every assumption built into the model um, things like projected market share of flower versus vapes versus edibles, um, things like indoor versus outdoor cultivation, things like crop loss are adjustable. Um, the default assumptions that are there when you open the model are our consultants best guesses um, based upon the data they received from our tourism department, from medical sales, from out of state data but you can actually adjust all of those assumptions yourself and see how it changes the outcomes. I say all this just as a warning um, that this model is a very powerful tool and it's downloadable for anyone to use, but it, it can be kind of tricky to understand how, how it's working. Um, some of the assumptions that were made on good data are already proving wrong, um, for instance, now that the actual market is starting to take shape. But um, for anyone who wants to see kind of the updated projections, um, it's on our website, ccb.vermont.gov slash reports. Um, some of the high level takeaways um, from the early numbers though is um, as of right now, we've 
issued just short of 350,000 square feet of canopy. We have the, about the same amount left in pending applications. Um, that number will change significantly after today, after we approve um, kind of 60 additional applications. Um, but the kind of total number, rough number of canopy um, in square footage is about 700,000. Um, our split between indoor and outdoor cultivation is skewing heavily towards outdoor. Um, that's both in actual licenses issued, but also in the pending applications. Um, if, you've if you take what we've already issued and add in the pending applications, we're about 35% indoor versus 65% outdoor. So that sort of breakdown is a very good um, you know, start to the market. It's very good from an environmental perspective, but it does create some um, very important considerations. Um, certainly early on um, and probably into the long term, um, Vermont is not going to have enough testing or product manufacturing capacity to meet all of the market's needs at harvest time. Um, if you're a cultivator, you should really um, start thinking about, you know, who are going to be your extractors, who are going to be uh, your testing, um, who's going to do your testing. And ultimately, you shouldn't rely on them being available right away. So you should also be thinking about storage. Um, if you're a lab or a product manufacturer, um, please think about how you might be able to meet the increased seasonal demand for your services around harvest time. Um, you know, this sort of indoor outdoor split can also lead to price instability at various times in the year. Um, just as a warning, our model does have some basic price assumptions based upon overall yields, but it doesn't take into consideration how prices may fluctuate throughout the year based upon harvest. Um, let me see, a banking update. So VSCCU, the Vermont State Employees Credit Union, has temporarily paused adding new accounts for cannabis businesses. Um, there is a ratio of cannabis accounts to compliance staff that is recommended by the National Credit Union Association and VSCCU has hit that quota. Um, it's my understanding that they're currently seeking additional staff and will resume opening new accounts as soon as possible. I just didn't get any indication from them whether that'll be in a few weeks or a few months. Um, it's my understanding that the New England Federal Credit Union still has capacity to open new cannabis accounts. Also, last week, the Vermont Federal Credit Union announced that they would begin opening cannabis accounts in Vermont. Um, both of those organizations' contact information is available on our website. Um, incidentally, an organization called the PBC just updated their banking cannabis directory. Um, there are a number of cannabis-specific banks that claim to operate nas nationally. I don't know anything about these banks, um, and this is certainly not an endorsement of any of them, but I did run their names by um, the Department of Financial Regulation, and DFR has verified that they're all legitimate financial institutions and all have deposit insurance through either the FDIC or the NCUA. So we're going to post those those banks, those financial institutions, along with their contact information to our FAQ page under banking. And as soon as we get an update from VSECU, we'll communicate that out as well. Um, inventory tracking, you know, I mentioned a few times uh, in the past, but we are going to go in a slightly different direction on inventory tracking than many other states. You're not going to need to put RFID tags on every plant or update your inventory each day. Um, you do need to track very specific data points about your inventory and how it's moving both within your business and through the supply chain. You'll need to report that data to the board at regular intervals. Um, with, with the help of a third party analytics firm, the board's going to be tracking that data and analyzing it for irregularities and suspicious activity. 
Um, but from a financial and human capital perspective, this system is a lot less intensive than what is required in some of the other major inventory tracking platforms. We have an agreement almost finalized with the company that's going to build the data reporting portal. It's going to be an extension of our licensing portal, and you should be able to access it directly through your CCB login, and it will be Salesforce based. Um, the, that sort of functionality and integration um, is not going to be ready until sometime this fall, though. So in the meantime, um, licensees will be required to submit their inventory records directly to the board through an online web based form that will be available on our website. The Agency of Digital Services has built these forms for us, um, but they're currently being tested, validated and debugged. Um, I do expect them to be ready, um, hopefully by the end of the week, maybe early next week. And our plan is to release both these specific inventory tracking data points for each license type, as well as these online forms um, where you can report your inventory as soon as possible. Um, when everything's ready, um, we can do a walkthrough of them at one of our next meetings, hopefully next week. Um, our, we also posted our testing uh, requirement flowchart that's um, available in our guidance document as well, uh, or in our guidance section of our website. Um, few basic administrative details. Um, so this is kind of a special message for anyone who's filling out license applications on behalf of another person or a business. Um, CSI, who conducts our background checks, um, has let us know that a bottleneck is forming in their processes due to a lack of communication from um, principals, financiers, owners, anyone who they're conducting background checks on. You know, sometimes they need to be in touch with the actual person um, that they're conducting a background check on, um, but they noted that sometimes the only contact information they have is for the law firm or the representative that filled out the application and not for the owner or principal themselves. So we've updated our forms, our application to stress that when it comes to these folks, the financiers, the owners, the principals, that we'd like you to put the people's actual contact information, not just the law firm's con contact information. And we think this will speed things up significantly. Um, finally, the tax department has updated its cannabis tax guidance document. It's very user friendly. It's easy to understand. Um, and you can find that at tax.vermont.gov slash business slash industry slash cannabis. And we also link to it on our guidance page. So um, other than that, um, I just we just need to approve the minutes from our last meeting, which was on August 10th, 2022. Kyle and Julie, have you had a chance to look at those minutes? Yes. Yes. All right. Is there a uh, motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so we this is the last um, meeting um, from our prior meeting schedule, regular meeting schedule. So we need to adopt um, our meeting schedule for um, the kind of remainder of the, the year. I know we circulated a document internally, but um, is it, can we pull that up? Is that, yeah. is that accessible? Sorry, I didn't mean to spring that on you. Nope, no, I should be able to find it um, in my in my inbox. Essentially, we're going to keep the same meeting schedule Wednesdays at one, but I think it's worth pulling it up because I think there's a few dates that fall on holidays. I have it pulled up, Brent, if you're not able to find it. I've got it. I've got it okay. now. All right. Um, thanks, so. though.
Okay. Okay. So these are the proposed meeting dates for the remainder of this calendar year. Um, the idea would be to stick with our current time of Wednesdays at one o'clock, except for a few exceptions. And those exceptions are noted. So we've got September 7th, September 14th, September 21st, September 28th. And then our first October meeting will be on October 6th, which is a Thursday. And then the remaining meetings in October, the 12th, 19th, and 26th are all Wednesdays. November will be um, the first three Wednesdays, which are the 2nd, the 9th, and the 16th. <clears throat> Thanksgiving week, um, we will not hold a meeting. So we will skip the 23rd and then meet again on the 30th of November. And then again, December 7th, 14th, and 21st are all Wednesdays. And then um, the last week of December, we will skip a meeting on the 28th. Great. Um, is there a motion to approve this uh, regular meeting schedule? Uh, I move that the Cannabis Control Board accept the meeting schedule as presented by staff. I'll second. Any any discussion at all? Nope. Nope. Looks good. All right. Good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Bryn. I'll turn things back over to you. Great. Okay, so we'll start uh, your register as we always do with some information about the medical cannabis program. Um, the data that you see in this week's register is for um, a number of weeks since we last met. So it's from August 10th until yesterday, the 30th. So um, in that time, we've received 56 new patient applications. Um, and 163 renewal applications, and we've issued 205 patient cards. Um, received three new caregiver applications and six renewal caregiver applications, and we've approved four. And we've also approved four employee uh, dispensary employee cards. Um, and as noted here, our staff are currently processing applications um, received on or after July 27th. Um, so that does put us about four days outside of our 30 day statutory window. Um, and we staff are aware that we are outside um, of this range. We've been in contact with uh, patients who have pending applications and we are developing some efficiencies to um, improve our timing on being able to process these applications. So hopefully we'll see an improvement there next week. So now we'll move on to our adult use license application. Um, and this data is up to date as of yesterday. Um, so there's a little bit of a wall of numbers here. I'll try and point out a few um, things of interest. The board has 63 um, full license applications um, that are recommended for licensure by staff this week. <clears throat> uh, the majority of those are mixed tier one cultivators. Um, also have nine outdoor cultivators up for recommendation this week. Um, and we have three tier two manufacturers up for recommendation this week and two wholesalers. Um, and then we have some stragglers, one indoor tier five, um, one mixed tier two, and then four outdoor cultivators um, that are not a tier one. Um, and you can see that the, we've got 19 retailers in the queue um, for review. And as the chair pointed out earlier, um, some of these applicants are currently under review. Um, staff has not updated that uh, status for everybody. Um, I just want to remind everybody that staff are really prioritizing reviewing these applications. And there are times that they are not able to update the status um, of that application exactly when they start reviewing it. Um, so we are still developing our internal processes and this is something that we will improve on as time goes on. Um, but I wanted to make everybody aware of that. Bryn, can I uh, just make a, make a point here based on this chart, which is sure. it looks like when I look at 
the kind of submitted, received, under review numbers for cultivators, it looks like we are largely through our backlog. Um, I know that there's some in incomplete status. Usually that means that it's incumbent upon the license, the applicant to do to take an action. And there's some in resubmitted, but for the mo most part, it looks like we're through our cultivator backlog. That's correct. Yes, the team is very, very excited about that. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to move on to our recommendations for this week. They have a long list, so I'm going to jump right in. And given the fact that we have a long list, I'm just going to th go through it by submission number and uh, license type. So we've got submission 13, um, applying for mixed tier one. Submission 68, applying for indoor tier one. Submission 103, mixed tier one. Submission 125, indoor tier one. Submission 139, indoor tier one. 141, indoor tier one. 143, indoor tier one. 146, indoor tier one. 206, in mixed tier one. 226, indoor tier one. 238, indoor tier one. 253, mixed tier one. 284, outdoor tier one. 285, mixed tier one. 286, mixed tier one. 290, mixed tier one. 296, mixed tier one. 297, mixed tier one. 308, indoor tier one. 309, mixed tier one. 315, mixed tier one. 322, mixed tier one. 331, outdoor tier one. 336, Indoor tier one, 339 mixed tier one, and 347 indoor tier one. Next page, um, submission 362 indoor tier one, 367 outdoor tier one, 371 mixed tier one, 417 mixed tier one, 432 indoor tier five. 440, outdoor tier four, 469, mixed tier one, 535, outdoor tier four, 582, mixed tier one, 584, mixed tier three, 590, mixed tier three, 605, outdoor tier one, 615, Outdoor tier two, 629, mixed tier one, 685, outdoor tier three, 703, indoor tier one, 718, mixed tier two, 740, outdoor tier two, 741, outdoor tier one, 755, mixed tier one, 765, outdoor tier two, 766, outdoor tier two, and 803, outdoor tier three, page three, <clears throat> 828, outdoor tier one, 837, indoor tier one, 895, indoor tier one, 912 is a wholesaler. 917, tier two manufacturing. 926, tier two manufacturing. 975, wholesaler. Submission 1000, outdoor tier one. 1017, tier two manufacturing. 1024, indoor tier one. 1029, Outdoor tier one, 1032, mixed tier one, 1290, outdoor tier one, 1360, outdoor tier one. 
And that is your full um, list. All of these applicants have demonstrated compliance with board rule and statute, and staff is recommending them for full licensure. Um, I will move on now to the social equity portion. Actually, first, we have a new addition to your register this week, which is um, some stats on license amendments. Um, and amendments are um, any change to your application um, that a licensee needs to, so if a licensee needs to update their application in any way that wouldn't trigger a license renewal, um, that is considered a license amendment. So we've got some numbers for you here. So we have um, mixed cultivator tier one um, who is licensed who is seeking an amendment and an outdoor tier one cultivator um, who is licensed, who is seeking an amendment. And these can be um, quite minor updates to um, contact information or even like a typo and a business name. So these are uh, amendments that don't, don't require board approval. Just some statistics for you to review. So moving on to the social equity stat, um, we have nine social equity applicants that are up for licensure this week. Um, as you can see, we've got many uh, in incomplete or resubmitted status, about 25, um, and we've approved or issued um, about 42 um, licenses to social equity applicants. That puts us at around 90, 90 uh, applicants who have social equity status or are seeking social equity status that are um, in, in the process. Or have a like, or have a social equity license. Um, and then we have four recommendations for social equity status this week. Um, we have submission 895. Uh, staff are recommending social equity status for this uh, applicant as they meet the criteria for social equity individual applicant as defined in board rule. Submission um, 1163. We are recommending social equity status for this applicant as they meet the criteria for a social equity business applicant as defined in board rule. Submission 923, our um, staff are recommending social equity status for this applicant as they meet the criteria for a social equity business applicant. And lastly, submission 916, um, also recommended for social equity status as they meet the criteria for a social equity business applicant. Um, and lastly, we've got four um, applicants that staff are recommending that the board deny social equity status for. Submission 740 and submission 567. Um, both of these applicants do not meet the criteria for social equity individual applicant as defined in board rule. Um, submission number 723. Staff are recommending denial for this applicant if they don't meet the criteria for social equity business applicant. Um, and lastly, submission number 91. Staff also recommend denial of social equity status for this applicant as they don't meet the criteria for social equity individual applicants as defined in board rule. And um, staff are ready to discuss these uh, social equity status denials in executive session with the board. Great. Well, it's a tremendous amount of work. Thank you um, for even, even just reading it. it was kind of a lot of work, um, but thank you for, for that. Um, uh, so, yes, I, I think what I heard is that the board um, should be going into executive session to discuss um, the social equity status denial recommendations by the staff. I think that's we should do that before we approve the um, the other 63 licenses and other recommendations. Yep. Agreed. Is there another item that we need to discuss in executive session as well? Yep, there are. So the board should discuss the um, staff recommendations for social equity status denial. And also there is one um, applicant who's up for recommended licensure this week who um, does have a Presumptively disqualifying offense on their record. Okay. Um, any sense of how long um, we'll need for executive session? I would. Um, I'm going to estimate at least thirty minutes. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
Great. Well, is there um, so before we vote on any of these, we're going to go into executive session. Is there a motion um, to, to enter executive session? I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the body and that the executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at substantial disadvantage. The board expects Susanna Davis, executive director of uh, the Department of Racial Equity and Jay Green, the racial equity research and policy analyst to uh, join executive session. I'll second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so um, why don't we say if it's 136 right now, why don't we come back like five after two? Um, and we'll shoot for that. Sometimes these do go a little bit long, but we'll shoot for just a little bit after two o'clock to return. All right, are we uh, ready? Is everyone ready to resume? Yep, let's do it. Okay. Um, so, um, just for a time check, it's 2.15. We ran a little bit long. Sorry about that. Um, so, the executive dis session, um, the board was looking at kind of the rationale behind the staff's referrals um, for the social equity denials and then also the rationale um, to recommend approving a applicant that had a presumptively disqualifying offense. And we kind of listened to their reasoning and we're ready to now vote um, as a board on um, their recommendations. And I think we can just lump them all together because I think the, the general gist was that we're going to approve all the staff recommendations. So is there a motion for that? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for uh, as presented to us in this meeting. I second. Any any discussion before the vote? No. Nope. Just again, as you mentioned a couple times, Pepper, thank you to everybody, even during the so-called time to take vacation, still rocking it. So it's impressive. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I agree. Um, OK, uh, well, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. And just to be clear, that was for all the staff recommendations, including the 63 um, licenses that we just approved. So um, that's great. Um, thank thank you, just as you mentioned, Kyle, to the staff for their diligent work. Um, and I think if I'm right, all we have left to do today is public comment. So, yep. All right. So why don't we do that? Um, thanks to everyone who joined the meeting today and kind of sat through the executive session. Um, if you'd like to make a public comment, um, we'll start with the people that join via the video link. Um, you can um, just raise your virtual hand. We'll call on you in the order that you raise your hand um, and then we'll move to people that join via the phone. Anyone for public comment? Keith? Hello, CCB. How are you today? Good, thanks. I just have a question um, on your track and trace system that you're going to be implementing. Why is Vermont going to be the outlier out of 20 states in the nation that are using metric? And metric is designed for track and trace and accountability for consumers and everything else and is very low cost to the state of Vermont or any other state that has been using it and it has excellent information um, through their portal and through their team trainings and it's very low cost it's it doesn't cost anything for the licensee holders to use that thing but to buy the tags or to use a laptop up to put their inventory in and that's all I need. I've spoken to one of their business, their government representatives, her name is Jean, and she said she would love Vermont to pick metric to use. And it's very, it's not complicated at all. So I'm just wondering why you guys are choosing to be the outlier out of 20 legal states using metric rather than going with metric, just out of curiosity. And then one other question, will you guys be conducting more round tables for the Medical patients of Vermont. 
Um, thanks for the questions. Um, and, and generally, we don't um, turn this into kind of a question and answer session. It's, it's really meant for people to provide comments to the board. However, um, we do um, note your questions and we try to kind of respond to them at our next meeting or um, kind of if there's kind of common questions that get answered or asked, then we update our guidance document. Um, but I'll um, kind of talk about track and trace at our next meeting, I suppose, and why we chose the path that we did. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, next, uh, Tree Frog Farms. Hey guys, thanks for everything you guys have done. Um, I was just looking for more uh, recommendations or uh, clarity info on as the track and trace system will develop this year. Um, after drying for curing and storage purposes, we'll be, be able to gather like strains into the same containers and kind of kind of bulk up. You know, we've we've harvested this from these ten plants, but once now they're dried. Um, they could all be stored or cured together and kind of lumped into their own trackability. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And um, again, I think our goal hopefully is to kind of walk through in more detail track and trace next week um, if we're ready. Um, otherwise, very soon after and we can kind of dig into some of these questions. Um, Shannon. Shannon, um, GRCC. Oh. Hey. Hi. I just wanted to make a quick comment on packaging. I know it's probably been something you guys have been hearing a lot, but um, we, I think we finally came to a solution for us, but I know uh, g getting there was very difficult. There's not, can you re maybe release something that has very clear guidelines on it? Because there's really not. It sends you on a wild goose chase to find all the different statues and what's required. Um, and also just to note that I understand why they're go you're going in a green direction with packaging, but it's very expensive and a lot of these manufacturers have very high minimums to get tin products to get glass with wooden lid products to get anything customized like that and so for us startup family businesses um small businesses that's a huge upfront cost to be putting out you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars to get con containers in different sizes with a five thousand, ten thousand minimum order. Um, so, just want to put that out there um, for everyone else who's frustrated and struggling with this. Yep. Thank. Thanks, Shannon. Tito. Hi there, hopefully everybody's having a great day. Um, I'm just, uh, I just want to make one comment when it comes to the disclosing the location of licensees. Um, I know we've been, we've been through a lot with that conversation um, and, and currently it's landed on just disclosing the town that you're in, but I'd really like to see that move to the county. I still think that the county accomplishes the goal of transparency yet is also vague enough to protect growers whose buildings cannot be hidden from the road always. And uh, sometimes these towns are really small and it's just it's just too hard to hide. Uh, and also, um, I've heard a lot that the state requires uh, any business to give them their physical location. And it's actually the state just requires a physical location, not the actual physical location necessarily where your cannabis is being grown. So I just wanted to point that out. And I really hope that you guys can uh, find it to, to switch to counties. I think that would uh, that would, that would do the trick. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully, I'm a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, Tito. Um, anyone else who joined via the link, please raise your virtual hand. Um, and then also, if you've joined via phone and would like to make a public comment, um, just hit star six to unmute yourself. Keith? 
Keith, uh, I see your hand up. You know, as a as a rule uh, during these meetings, we don't do it was a mistake, comments. Sorry. What's what's that? It was a mistake. I was moving my oh, mouse. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Um, no problem. Go down, stupid thing. Dave Silverman. Hey, uh, thanks for all the work and thanks to the staff for all the work they did the last two weeks. It really uh, showed the number of, uh, of applications. Um, I know that there are still a lot of um, manufacturer applications in the queue. And given the um, you know, race against the clock to, um, to get products into stores. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to repeat a public comment I made a few meetings ago uh, about the potential for expediting the CSI background check process for those pending applications. My sense is your process is to wait until the initial staff review before authorizing CSI background checks. The CSI background checks then take a week, possibly two weeks, depending on the complexity. Um, if there's any way uh, for your manufacturing applicants that are in, in the queue to push that forward for the CSI check before the initial staff review is done, get them done so that there's not an additional wait after the initial review, that would be very, very helpful. Um, to anybody who wants to open retail on October 1, uh, board willing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Anyone else uh, for public comment, um, either virtually or on the phone? And again, the phone, it's star six to unmute yourself. Okay, um, we'll um, close the public comment window. Again, you can always reach out to the board. Um, you know, if you go to ccb.info at vermont.gov, it goes out to all of our inboxes. Um, any comments you wanna make there? Um, and other than that, um, we'll see you next Wednesday. I'll uh, adjourn the meeting, thank you.